Well, good morning, everyone. We're here at the uh, in the Toronto Star at One Young Street, Toronto, with Green Party leader Elizabeth May. Welcome, Ms. May. Thank you very much for coming in. Thank you for um, having me. We're here with uh, members of the Star's editorial board, uh, senior reporters, editors, and our CEO publisher, John Boynton. Um, and we've it's part of a series we're doing, inviting the federal party leaders in the pre-writ period to come in and talk about um, an issue that they're particularly passionate about. And um, uh, we had Jagmeet Singh of the NDP in recently. Tomorrow, on Wednesday the 4th at noon, we'll have Andrew Scheer, leader of the Conservative Party of Canada. On Thursday the 5th at 11 a.m., we'll have Justin Trudeau in his, capaci in his capacity as leader of the Liberal Party of Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, there will, they will, other leaders will also be bringing in an issue they want to talk about that they're particularly passionate about. Now, Ms. May, thank you for coming in again. You've chosen taking action to fight climate change. Yeah as the issue that you are particularly passionate about. Probably doesn't come as any yeah. big surprise from the leader of the Green Party. But I'd like to invite you to um, just tell us why you chose that issue, why it's particularly important now, and what is the passion that animates uh, this for you. Yeah. And after that, we'll take questions from people around the table. Well, thanks. And I want to say hello to everyone around the table and people who are watching this live streaming. It's, uh, it's a great opportunity to be able to talk to you about this. And I know it sounds, uh, initially in talking to, uh, to folks at the Star who set this up, um, the idea that this is a personal issue, I take it very personally. I've been working on the climate crisis as an issue since I first learned about it in 1986. I was then senior policy advisor to the Federal Ministry of Environment. My background was entirely volunteer activism and environmental activism and a whole range of issues that led me eventually to law school. It's a longer story, but I'll keep it short and just say I ended up being recruited into the office of the Federal Minister of Environment in the majority Mulroney government, which was you know, not a logical uh, step and, and somewhat of a surprise to me when the minister, when he asked me to come meet with him, I assumed it was because I was at that point co-chairing a large national conference in environment development and peace issues, uh, sort of the, the cluster of issues that we talked about a lot in that era around the Brundtland Commission. Anyway, I thought we were talking about the Environment Canada's involvement in that conference, and to my shock, he said, well, I'd like you to come work in this office. So anyway, uh, after stumbling over, well, you know I'm not a Tory, right? He said, yeah, I, I, I didn't think you were, but I, you're not anything else either, are you? I said, no, it's okay. So I started learning my climate science from Environment Canada scientists in that era. I'd done work on acid rain and ozone depletion and pesticides and nuclear and all sorts of forest management questions, but I hadn't really come to grips with what a terrifying prospect global warming really was. But I also wasn't terrified because in that era we were saying, okay, well, we'll do this on acid rain, we'll solve that, we'll do this on ozone depletion, we'll solve that. So to put it in short form, I've had a front row seat for over 30 years of procrastination. And I've watched to my horror as good intentions have been ditched for short-term partisan advantage. And the science on climate change was never uncertain. It was not even in the, we had the big Toronto conference that I helped organize was the last week of June, 1988. And really the first global target on climate change was called the Toronto target because it emerged from the conference that was then called our changing atmosphere implications for global security. I quite often think that if we would kept the focus on security threat, we might have gotten more action because it tends to be the case that an environmental issue is seen as something you get to when the important stuff is done if you have time and there's enough money left in politics. But I've been working on climate for so long and it j just was like a kick in the gut when I, and it was only this year that I realized that from 1992, when in Rio at the Earth Summit, we signed the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, in which Canada had, qu had quite a role. I, it was, frankly, I was frustrated at the time that the document was so weak. But we signed, we were, Canada was the first industrialized country to sign and ratify the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Anyway, every country on Earth signed and ratified. And since that moment when we said we have to revert the rising anthropogenic greenhouse gases 
before they become dangerous, and dangerous is the word used in the convention. Since that time till now, we have emitted more greenhouse gases than we had emitted from the beginning of the Industrial Revolution till the Earth's summit. So it's really personal. It was personal when I was there when Mulroney signed the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change because my daughter was not yet one year old, and uh, I was holding her at the Earth Summit through all of the goings on. Uh, it never occurred to me at that moment, and had it, I don't know that I could, how I would have carried on, that when my daughter was 28 years old, we'd still be talking about whether we're going to take action and whether incremental, short term, uh, this party's a little better than that party would be the conversation we'd still be having. So we are now at a moment of climate emergency and so stated by the resolution from the Liberal Party in Parliament, which we all passed. Uh, we are in a climate emergency which requires that status quo decision making is over and it really has to be nonpartisan. So it's a personal passion because I've been aware for longer than most people, I suppose, just by virtue of my age, that this is the most uh, serious threat other than nuclear war that humanity faces. The thing that makes it particularly frustrating is that it is something we could have acted on and averted everything we're now experiencing. Uh, we had the opportunity, when I say we, whenever I say we in this context, I mean all of humanity, all nations on earth. And we have failed to take action when it was easy. And guess what? Now it has to be dramatic and bold and completely outside status quo decision making for us to be able to ensure that the children living right now, like by the time my daughter is my age, there's a significant threat that human civilization will not be there to support the society that faces extreme and accelerating potentially runaway global warming. And runaway global warming is a thing we must avert. Mm -hmm. We cannot avert climate change. We've We've done that. So it, in a nonpartisan sense, as a leader, what I want to see after the election is that we work together as leaders, as people who are aware of the facts, in something that approximates what the war footing of decision making was in the Second World War, in that you need an inner cabinet that's nonpartisan because you're facing an existential threat and you don't want survival to be a political football. So that's a sense of, and obviously my, my daughter who's 28 uh, has half brothers and sisters who are my stepkids and through them I have seven grandkids and I do, I will not uh, apologize for feeling fairly emotional about uh, deciding that short term political advantage has year after year after year been more important than our kids future and I, and I don't think people ever think of it that way, I don't mean my, my friends who make these decisions to compromise and think, oh, well, we can't get reelected unless we buy a pipeline, we've got to do this thing and that thing. These are horrific things. Mm -hmm. And they don't fit in an equation. They don't, the numbers aren't negotiable. So my, my friend Bill McGibbon in the US says, you know, the, the, um, the, you can't compromise with physics. You can't find somewhere in the middle that still works. There's only one course and it's really hard, but it is possible. So that's, that's why, made the case that this is, for me, a very deeply personal issue. So you've got an awful lot of evidence on your side. Yeah. You know, you, you frequently cite the uh, IIPC report of last year yeah. in support of all this. And yet, after so much talk about this, as you know, there's any number of polls that show that Canadians will say in great numbers, you know, that climate, they're very concerned about climate change. In fact, in some polls, it comes right at the top of their yeah. concerns, um, ahead of things like immigration and even jobs at times. And yet, they will say, when they're pressed a bit, that they're actually not very prepared to pay much or do much about it. Um, so there's a huge gap between what they say they believe and want and what they are apparently prepared to do and surely that is you know the key problem for yourself and others who uh, are aware of the problem and very concerned about it and indeed passionate about it how can you close that gap I don't I, I find it bizarre that we think we have to 
When I worked in the Mulroney government and we realized that leaded gasoline was causing intellectual deficiencies in children on a population basis, we didn't poll to find out if Canadians were ready to ban lead and gasoline. It was, it was an evidence-based decision. It was pretty obvious. It, well, it was obvious. It had been obvious from 70 years earlier when the debate happened on the floor of the U.S. Congress about allowing lead and gasoline. There was a debate. Alice Walker at the time generally acknowledged to be the founder, one would have, if she had been a man, the father of public health said on the floor of the U.S. Congress, we shouldn't allow lead and gasoline. It's a toxic substance. This isn't a good idea. But it did take 70 years to get it banned. But we didn't close the gap with polling. So, okay, look, this is dangerous. Uh, we didn't say to people who were driving cars that depended on leaded gas, how prepared are you to drive less or change your... Now, I recognize that our addiction to fossil fuels is a larger scale problem than one particular substance. But on no issue have we ever said... Or what are people prepared to do at an individual level, or how do people feel about it? I think the fact that Canadians, in overwhelming numbers, and in numbers, I can remember the polling going back to the early 90s, and the point at which it became clear that public education had allowed Canadians to differentiate between ozone depletion and warming gases, that they understood the issues were different. Some ozone depleters were also warming gases, but I mean, public awareness and education in Canada has always been significantly higher than that south of the border. Canadians in numbers of pretty consistently from the early 90s at 80% see fossil fuel burning as connected to global warming and a bad thing. Hmm. There's a point where leadership comes in and governments need to be able to make it easy and it would have been so much easier in the early 90s or the earlier parts of this century had we taken action. The fact it's still doable, it's, it's um, uh, a very difficult issue for those of us who understand that we're, we're actually down to not years but months in which we can save ourselves. Mm -hmm. Because the IPCC report to which you referred and the reason I refer to it is it actually was so strong and clear that we have to hold to no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius global average temperature warming compared to what global average temperature was before the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And that's a long sentence and a messaging challenge for anyone, but that's the only way you can express it and not leave out key things. I was appalled to hear Joe Oliver the other day being interviewed and talking about the one and a half percent or the two percent. The man doesn't know the difference between percents and degrees, never mind. Understanding the science is critical. And the IPCC report that came out October 8th, 2018 was a response to a direct request from all the countries that were together in Paris at COP21 in December 2015 because we had just negotiated a treaty where the goal is hold global average temperature increase to no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius or as far below 2 degrees as possible. That's the actual language in the treaty. So world leaders all gathered there said we'd like a report from the IPCC please by 2018 to tell us what's the difference between 1.5 and 2. That information is there for anyone to see. And the IPCC says we have to basically 45% below 2010 levels by 2030. You don't then say, well, we have 12 years because the report came out in 2018. No, if you're gonna make that kind of dramatic transition of the world's economies, we're counting in months what our opportunities are. Therefore, I can't understand why anyone would think we should be concerned if 80 to 90% of Canadians under, are concerned about climate crisis. Governments have the information to know what we have to do. I think we bring everybody along, mobilize everyone, inspire everyone, engage with everyone who's concerned, alleviate a lot of eco-anxiety or eco-grief as it's now being described, as an increasing number of young people are feeling a sense that what kind of future have I got? Mm. This is the impetus, of course, for the for the youth school strikes. Anyway, I don't want to belabor the point, just I don't think one has to close a gap that small for governments to do what we are required to do to ensure that we don't have an economy that collapses, because that's, you know, it's not like the economy does well if the planet's on fire. The economy does not do well if, we, if we're in a death spiral. Nothing does well. Right, indeed. We're here at the Toronto Star with... Uh... Green Party leader Elizabeth May, as part of our series of discussions on issues with federal leaders 
on issues that they are particularly passionate about, and we're discussing fighting climate change. So to follow up on that, I mean, the I understand what you're saying. But governments that have gone down that road, we can go locally or we can look at internationally, have um, found that they it's pretty hard to just simply tell people how to behave and what to think. I mean, for example, in France, the uh, Yellow Vest protest movement started out to some to a large, fairly large degree about rising energy prices. I mean, you can look at the wing government in Ontario. So it's a real problem for leaders, is it not, to manage public opinion. And I, I must press you again on that, because the idea that you can sort of have a, a, a top-down directive, tell everybody that this is going to happen, seems uh, pretty questionable when you look at what's happened to other governments. What choice do we have? I'm laying out the science that tells us that we have months in which to change our course if we want our children to have a livable world, not future generations in some hypothetical, our own children. What choice do we have but to show some courage? Now, as it happens, the Yellow Vest movement was not an anti-climate change movement. I, I have, fortunately, I was, I was it, um, we happened to be together in Kotowice, Poland, for the last climate negotiation when that began to blow up. And so I was able to easily access my friends from Green Party France, saying, what's this about? They said, no, no, les gilets jaunes, ce n'est pas contre les gilets contre l'urgence climatique. What it was that said, in part. In, well, part in, in hypocrisy, it was the hypocrisy that Macron was giving his billionaire friends tax cuts while also expecting those who were more up against it than anyone else higher gas prices to get to work. A lot of the Yellow Vest folks showed up also at the much larger. They had 10,000 Yellow Vests at one protest. That same week, they had 100,000 people on the streets of Paris for climate action, many of them wearing Yellow Vests. These were not, this was not a movement against. Now, I take your point that Catherine Wynne's government went down to defeat, uh, which is, and had much better climate policies. Very interesting, I think, that had not Patrick Brown run up against the scandal that pushed him out, the, the progressive conservatives of Ontario, up until very few months before the election, had carbon pricing in their platform too. So it's a question not for me of short-term partisan punishing, or nor is it, I want to pick up on this point too, Andrew, it's really important to acknowledge that this is not about governments imposing their will. This is about saying status quo decision making is over, we're going to have to work together. Here are the steps we think will work, and we've put them forward in Mission Possible, because we say it's not Mission Easy, but it's Mission Possible to go off fossil fuels. But ideally, any government, regardless of, of liberal or conservative or NDP, whatever, as leaders, if we, have, if we take the time to understand the science, we have one course to ensure our kids have a livable world. What political obligation is stronger than ensuring the security and safety of this species on this planet, Canadians now living on this part of the planet, we have to start showing some global leadership as a country again. But you can't do that when we're laggards in the world, and we are laggards in the world. So you take these things in steps and say, how many Canadians would like government help? We'd like to send you some trees. How many of you would like to plant some? I'm a Rotarian. I know that my Rotary Club, ask Rotarians, how many, hands up, we've been trying to eliminate global polio. Hands up how many Rotarians would like to plant trees? Lots. Hands up how many schools would like us to send you solar panels and you get them installed on the roof of the school. There's solar panels on the roof of one of the schools in my uh, constituency, it's called uh, Gulf Island Secondary School. We all chipped in and put on solar panels. And the solar panels create uh, enough savings to BC Hydro that we now have solar scholarships in the graduating year based on the money saved. People want to engage. Give Canadians a place of, I'm in, tell me what to do. It's, it's why I really applaud what Justin Trudeau did in saying we want to take Syrian refugees. Every part, in every part of this country, everywhere I go, community groups stepped up for sponsorships. We want to. I am absolutely certain that it's not a top down. It's bottom up. But the top is suppressing public will to change. And the top is being controlled far too much by big oil and a fossil fuel lobby that pretends that their corporate profits align with our economy or jobs 
and they're not. They're absolutely antithetical to our survival. Therefore, people who have any kind of, well, if you go down to defeat on trying to stop the, 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 the deliberate loss of survival chances for our own children and their children, then okay. But this is not a time for compromise. We have one chance and it's in, you can count it, you can count it down in months. And the window on holding to 1.5 degrees Celsius will have closed before the 2023 federal election. So yeah, I think Canadians desperately want to see some leadership. My colleagues want to jump in. Diane? Um, Ms. May, I, I understand your point about getting off the fossil fuels, but I know the Green Party's stance is against nuclear power, even though a lot of countries in Europe who have the lowest emissions are, do have a lot of nuclear power mm -hmm. as their source. Can you explain that to us? Explain, explain, well, Diane. It would be easier to get off of fossil fuels if ah, you went well, with nuclear. Actually, no, it wouldn't, uh, because nuclear energy takes a tremendously long time to, even if you exclude all the reasons that Greens around the world oppose nuclear, such as we don't, we don't have a solution to high-level nuclear waste, there's a very small risk of a very large accident, all of those things, put them aside. Just imagine it was a matter of what's the fastest way to go off fossil fuels. Nuclear is your worst choice. Your first choice for the lowest cost per carbon ton of carbon averted is in investing in your built infrastructure and making it as energy efficient as possible. Very low cost, very high rewards, and lots of people employed. Your, and by the way, the, the large capital costs of nuclear are also tied to very, very low employment generation and also long time spans. We would not close down existing nuclear reactors, but we wouldn't put money into retrofitting and refurbishing. But we've done the crunching of the numbers. If after you get through the very low cost options, but we've always been calling it the low hanging fruit. The low hanging fruit in this country is now falling on the floor and we're stepping all over it. But we've got the low hanging fruit of making our buildings more energy efficient. That's a key point of mission possible. We also want to, uh, we do need major investments in energy infrastructure, but it's not pipelines. It's our electricity grid, which needs to have interties that connect each province to each other. So the provinces that are already 100% renewable energy are better able to sell east-west instead of what we now do, which is mostly to the US. So we need to get hydro, uh, hydro Quebec energy into the Maritimes while we ramp up renewables. And the potential for renewables in this country is huge. Uh, Alberta has the best renewable opportunities in solar. They also have currently 100,000 abandoned deep oil wells. About 10% of them are suitable for geothermal power that actually generates green electricity. We could convert a toxic legacy into, and probably in, I hope, because the first ones of these are in partnerships with Indigenous First Nations. So part, take those abandoned wells and where they have geothermal potential, start generating green electricity. Wind energy, yes, geothermal, tidal, which is still in its infancy but has huge potential, particularly for a country like Canada with three coasts. Solar, wind, hydro, renewables, and storage. Storage is key, so you need to be able to do pumped storage. There are a lot of abandoned quarries across Canada. Any abandoned quarry at any elevation is there for pumped storage because we do get more energy when the wind is blowing and the sun is shining than you can use in that period. You have to store it for when the wind isn't blowing and the sun isn't shining. So nuclear actually is not necessary at all to meet our rapid trajectory off fossil fuels to a green 100% decarbonized electricity grid, the conversion of our vehicle fleet to electric, or we don't, we don't prescribe technologies. If fuel cells and hydrogen overtake EVs in the marketplace, that would be great too. But we need to t tell the market very clearly we will not be selling internal combustion engines in this country by 2030, so plan for that. And we really need to work hard to get EV manufacturing in our, in our auto sector so that we're competitive with the world and we're not just buying electric vehicles from other countries. But anyway, in a nutshell, nuclear isn't an answer. Thanks, Carrie? Dan. Carrie? Um, you're talking about the imperative of fighting climate change and the other parties 
are focused on um, middle class struggles and the desire to make life more affordable. I guess I'm wondering, do you feel like you're playing a, a different game entirely? And if so, how do you see that playing out in the upcoming election? Well, there's no, I, I, I don't, yeah, Carrie, I'm not going to, I just say it's, I don't feel like it's a game, but I, I didn't, know. I know you didn't mean it that way, so I just <laughs> didn't want to jump on your head. Yeah. Look, as the, my answer to Yellow Vest was suggesting, and I need to say it more clearly, there is no response to the climate crisis where equity doesn't run right down the middle of it. You cannot solve the climate crisis and ignore poverty, equity issues, affordability. Now, frankly, it's way more affordable once you make the marginal cost of energy zero. Once you install solar energy in a home, your energy is coming for free to your roof. There are, once you insulate a home, the costs of living go down. So affordability is a key aspect of acting on the climate crisis. But we don't ignore, I mean, our platform, this is this conversation about what personally drives me, uh, making sure my children can live to my age without society collapsing around them. I like the idea that when my daughter is my age, if she dials 911, someone answers. These are important things. It's also important that my daughter, who's still working on her PhD, will be able to, with her partner, someday buy a house. That's really out of reach for people. It's really important to me that any Canadian know that, particularly our young people who are right up against it with student debt, that's why we're calling for abolishing tuition and funding post-secondary education in a meaningful way, because post-secondary education, whether you're going to get your ticket for a Red Seal trade or you're working on your PhD, uh, is, is, I think, at the moment of, uh, just on the, on the cusp of a real crisis because of a lack of adequate funding, because it, you're getting more and more first years in larger and larger theaters where the professor is farther and farther distant, mm -hmm. might as well be on a TV screen. So we, want, uh, we are very committed to, to making post-secondary education affordable, to making housing affordable, to bringing in real pharmacare, to revisiting our commitment to the Canada Health Act to ensure that every Canadian has access to you know, excellent health care. So none of those things are ignored by us by any means. But I think the average Canadian is more troubled by the climate crisis than other parties may think. When I go, I've just recently uh, been on a tour of 33 Canadian communities, big and small, in every province and in the Northwest Territories listening to things that people raise in meetings from all walks of life. In towns as small as Ashcroft, BC, which has a thousand people living there, to Vancouver, to Montreal, to Halifax, and so on. Climate, now of course, I am the person at the front of the room. I talk for 20 minutes and open the microphone for two hours. People can raise anything. But right across the country, what people talk about is being very, very concerned about the climate crisis. And the younger the person in the audience is, the more concerned they are. Uh, the fact that we have, I don't know how many hundreds of Canadian communities and young people participated in the March 15th uh, school strike for climate. I don't think that the issues I'm raising are some sort of elite small group of people worried about it. The, the, the depth of the anxiety goes quite far through all strata of our society. And I think it particularly worries grandparents and kids. I think those are the two groups that are going to go hardcore uh, and say, we, we don't compromise on this. But I agree with you. It's, it's important not, you know, the, the idea of the struggle of the middle class, yes, that's, that's most of the verbiage from my colleagues. And they probably have better communications advice than I do. But I'm not going to go down without a fight when my kids' future is at stake. We're here at the Toronto Star talking with a Green Party leader, Elizabeth May, as part of our series, uh, inviting federal party leaders to come in and talk about issues that they are particularly passionate about. Um, just, you're, Jordan, would you like the, you got the microphone, good. Please go ahead. Thanks. Um, hi, Ms. May, I'm Jordan Hungfarb, I'm the Star's politics editor. Um, as you know, Canada's a big country. Uh, we uh, Canadians travel. It's a cold country. We have to heat. Fossil fuels uh, are an important part of our economy. What does a responsible transition away from fossil fuels actually look like? Oh, thank you, Jordan. Yeah, we are. We're a big country, although I've got to say we're a pretty small family. I always have a, I sort of test myself in the first 
two minutes of a conversation with anyone, how long does it take me to find a mutual friend? Um, lovely former city councilor from Medicine Hat, Alberta, came up to talk to me yesterday at the Saanich Fair, and, and we clocked two mutual friends in 30 seconds. I said, oh, this is good. You know, this is the kind of thing that happens, right? So we are, and we also, we're a big country, but we're also a country, we, I used the term climate emergency earlier. Locally, what is what's being experienced right now is climate emergencies. So when I'm on the ground locally, I mentioned Ashcroft, they had uh, two weeks when they were on forest fire evacuation alert. Other communities I talked to were, were, were calling the, in New Brunswick recent flooding. Anyway, moving to how we make that transition, it starts with the steps that were, uh, the, the, this is well studied territory, right? So I'm not, uh, the, the, the most thorough analysis globally of how to get from where we are now to where we need to go, it's a very big study called deep decarbonization. You've probably heard of it. And in deep decarbonization, the, the study, the Canada study, started with decarbonize the electricity grid, build up the electricity grid, get off fossil fuels for automobiles. So we will be using some fossil fuels for some time into the future, but you need to move rapidly to getting everything you can get to renewables as quickly as possible. Where you, and a lot of our, well, you know, tremendous amount of our fossil fuel use in Canada is, of course, the transportation sector. And electric vehicles are falling in price. We can do much more. We can create that infrastructure for them. But again, going in steps, decarbonize the electricity grid, build it up to make it more robust so you can get renewable energy from one province to the other easily, keep the prices low, keep pressing our major utilities to do those requests for proposals. The, the one in Alberta that recently came in for Canmore was like three cents a kilowatt hour huge project in wind energy, very smart. So you start looking at those steps and the massive infrastructure improvements. We wouldn't need to have, believe it or not, I mean, this is the extreme, but you would actually wouldn't need a furnace in a home in Canada if the house was insulated to the extent, the maximum extent possible. Body heat and excess heat from all the appliances in the house would keep the house very livable. But we, our built infrastructure for the most part was built when we thought energy was cheap and abundant we weren't worried about the fact that it cost us a lot to heat our houses. So in the winter, we heat the outdoors, and in the summer, we pay to cool the outdoors. So that maximizing that insulation, improving, and a lot of it is, is really literally the insulation, not the more expensive new doors, new windows, and so on. Uh, maximizing what you can do with geothermal. District energy, and one of the ways that Denmark saved a lot of uh, energy to heat in a cold climate was to map, they did a thermal map, of where's the waste heat in Copenhagen? Like what buildings are generating heat that's just wasted? And how do we, through district energy, capture the waste heat from one building to preheat the water into the next building? So we're, we're not used to thinking like this because we have fairly fossilized thinking within our largest utilities. And they need to break out of the ways they typically run our electricity sector. Because really, when you think about the idea of the marginal cost of electricity can be zero, that is a mind-blowing change in the business plan of our largest utilities. But we move through it stepwise in ways that give Canadians assurance that you know what you're doing, that this works, we have examples to draw from other countries, and certainly uh, other countries are miles ahead of us. Uh, the, the UK is miles ahead of us, although they're now facing a political crisis, but that has nothing to do with their climate actions. Sweden, Costa Rica, lots of countries are miles ahead of us in moving towards net zero for carbon. And we need to, and at the point about the economy and the importance of fossil fuels to our economy, that's a critical point. And that's why we need to point to the economic opportunities that are enormous in our oil companies shifting their business plan to energy companies. And a lot of them are there. I mean, they've got the plans. They're ready to go. They're not, they're not uh, unaware in the major big oil. I mean, some big oil has been much more responsible than others. I wouldn't paint them all with the same brush. There's the companies like ExxonMobil that spent a lot of money to lie to people. And there's companies like Royal Dutch Shell that said, okay, we better have a hydrogen division. We better get going with solar. We better be thinking about this. There's a reason that Royal Dutch Shell pulled out of the tar sands and the oil sands. I call them oil sands. Uh, it's, it's stranded. It's stranded asset. It's unburnable carbon. So when you know ConocoPhillips, Royal Dutch Shell, Total Asset, SA, uh, the, 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 the exodus away from the oil sands is not because these companies saw the light around 
climate change. They're, they're looking at the reality that they do not want to be invested in oil sands when it becomes clear that that is a liability and they don't want stranded assets. It always gets reported in the business pages in Canada, by the way, great opportunity for Canadian businesses to buy into the oil sands. There's a reason the largest transnationals are leaving. It's not economical. And we need to stop sinking public funds into a, a loser economically, like a Trans Mountain Pipeline. Could I just follow up with a question? I'd like to, if, if things were to go your way and uh, everybody would, you know, the light bulb would go off over everybody's heads and people would put partisanship aside and there'd be a war cabinet yes. in, in, in quotation marks to, to direct things. How would how would our lives how would my life change over the next say three or four years? I mean, would I would I be would I fly to Vancouver uh, or would it become so expensive because we would want to discourage that? Would I um, if I wanted to go up north in my uh, my uh, car would that become more expensive because we want to discourage that? Would I be subsidized to get an e vehicle? What concretely mm -hmm. would my, how would my life concretely change? Uh, and be impacted. And let's be honest about it. There, there must be costs here. Yeah. And, and what would be the costs and how would they impact me? We focus the whole climate debate. I'm really glad you asked the question, Andrew, because so far the climate debate in this country has been a really unedifying sort of punch and Judy show over carbon taxes. Carbon pricing is in the Green Party strategy a very small part. It's an essential part to try to level the playing field. It's to eliminate the skewing of market signals. It's critical that the second piece that the Liberals promised, they brought in the carbon pricing, they have not yet fulfilled the promise to stop subsidizing fossil fuels. In fact, they've increased the subsidies to fossil fuels quite substantially. But level that playing field. The, the market signal, we, don't, we, would, we would prefer a method of carbon pricing that's different, but I'm not gonna go into the weeds on carbon pricing, just to say it's a piece. It's a relatively small piece. So we're not trying to get you to go off fossil fuels by punishing you. We think the system needs to change. So let's invest in getting that infrastructure for a Canadian grid strategy. There's really cool proposals right now that even take the Canadian grid into none of it. Proposals where the free market investors who want to do this are working with the Inuit Tepirisek Katanami to bring green electricity into none of it. There's a proposal to get more green electricity in the Northwest Territories. So we talk about a Canadian grid strategy. It's a big piece of where we're going as a party, and it doesn't happen overnight. It's a big job creator. It's a big infrastructure project. It costs about the same as the public funds that are now committed to the aforementioned uneconomical loser Trans Mountain Pipeline. So for your next few years, I don't think you'll experience anything personally very differently. I'd like to think that in your family, if not you, but I think you'll probably say, okay, that's a great idea. Apparently, we can help be part of this public national mobilization by doing more vegetable gardening on our property. We can be part of this national mobilization by signing up to be one of the leaders in our community that gets more democratized renewable energy at our house. We can be part of this, and yes, more, more ways to encourage people to move into an electric vehicle at a more affordable price, absolutely. But we'll also be, at the same time, it takes a while to ramp up uh, a cross-country electricity grid. Uh, it may involve what used to be called gas stations. They may be fast charging stations where people can pull up and recharge faster than we currently are. The innovations that are happening in that technology are so fast, I wouldn't predict them. And the Green Party doesn't prescribe technologies. We just want to open the opportunity by saying, OK, here's a clear market signal, folks. We're going off fossil fuels. There'll be a 60% reduction in our emissions by 2030. You know what that looks like. We have, the, we, we, we have a lot of background documentation, uh, more in our platform and even more in background documents that we posted to the website to explain exactly how th what this looks like. But I hope, I mean, I'm not trying to sugarcoat it. There'll be changes. But in the, in the parameters of your question, uh, I think I'd like to say how your life will change is that you'll be happier and more inspired. <laughs> what about oil workers? Yeah. How many 
oil jobs would be lost in the first term of a green government and what would you do to mitigate the damage to, to those workers, especially given your commitment to equity? Yeah, well, the fossil fuel sector is going to lose all the jobs. But in the first term. No, no, not the first term. I'm asking about the first First term, term no. By 2030, between 2030 and 2035, be out of the oil sands. We start by saying, look, let's, if we're going to go off fossil fuels, and for this, by the way, we actually do need to ratify the second version of NAFTA. Believe it or not, getting rid of the energy chapter in NAFTA is pretty critical. But we would want to prioritize that we only use Canadian oil while we're going off oil in order to get to the question of Canadian workers. There's no reason for the climate to make the position that we've taken. It's about giving us enough landing room for workers to make sure there's time for a just transition because we're very committed to it, the just transition strategies. One of the world leading pieces of work in just transition was just completed this year by the task force on coal sector workers. It was co-chaired by a friend of mine from the environmental movement in New Brunswick, Lois Corbett, and by the president of the Canadian Labour Congress, Hassan Youssef, and they visited each one of the communities that will be affected by going off coal. And so that strategy starts with very strong principles of full engagement of the workers, full engagement of the specific communities that are going to be impacted, so that the strategies make sense for the workers. Things like bridging pensions. If you're almost at your retirement, you're not going to want to upscale and find yourself a different job. The workers in the fossil fuel sector are highly skilled workers. Their skills are easily transferable. I mentioned the deep oil wells in Alberta, 100,000 abandoned, 40,000 abandoned wells in BC, by the way. Another, I don't know how many thousand in Saskatchewan. The workers who drilled those wells are ideally trained to work on geothermal from those wells. The workers who lay pipe have exactly the same skill sets we need to put up windmills. These are not hard transitions to make. And no one, particularly Jason Kenney, no one is screaming about the tens of thousands of jobs that have been eliminated in the oil sands by automation. The industry has shed jobs. They have driverless trucks now. They have done a lot to stay, because bitumen production is a loser economically. I mean, it's, it's, high, it's the most expensive fossil fuel product, and it's the product with the lowest value. So you're up against it if you're producing bitumen, if you're not selling oil at a global price of, of over $100 a barrel. So at the prices we're currently getting for oil, it doesn't matter whether you get it to famous Tidewater or not, it's still a very low value product because it's a solid, and you have to upgrade it to synthetic crude before you can get it to any refinery. So it's... The conundrum here is to stay profitable, the oil sector in the oil sands has been shedding jobs for years because they need to automate because their business is a loser. We want to make sure those workers have confidence that they are not going to be left high and dry, that they can make their mortgage payments. And the, the, so the principles and the strategies of the coal sector worker report will govern how we as a green government ensure that workers are protected, have confidence in the future, and have new jobs with the skill sets they already have, or with modest amount of what they now call upskilling. But generally, we have right now, and I say as a member of parliament and leader of a party, what I hear from employers all the time is that they are experiencing shortages. The mining industry is desperate for mining engineers. The airline industry is desperate for pilots. Schools are desperate for French teachers. I, across the country, what we are experiencing, and what I hear is an economic limitation on success for businesses across Canada, is that they can't find workers for the jobs they've got. We do not have a crisis of too many workers and not enough jobs. Quite the opposite. The challenge of Mission Possible is to find enough and train up enough young people to take the jobs in electricians and plumbing and carpentry that we will need to retrofit all the buildings. While we get the microphone over there, I just want to remind everyone we're here at the Toronto Star with Green Party leader Elizabeth May as part of our series of chats with federal leaders on issues that they are passionate about. Diane? Hi, Ms. May. I'm sorry I didn't introduce myself last time. I'm Diane Reinhart from the editorial board. Um, you mentioned the fight over the carbon tax in Canada as being much like a Punch and Judy show. Yeah. And I just wondered how you would get the premiers on side 
uh, to work with the federal government on these issues. Yeah, I, sh I should uh, I should say how dispiriting it is to be in Parliament for this kind of debate. I have to say, on every side of the House, including the Conservative Party, there are people just as passionate about climate crisis as I am. They understand it and they relate it to their own kids. Um, in 2011, when I was first elected, I I've came up with the idea that we needed an all-party climate caucus. We've been holding sessions with experts for briefings for any MP who wants to show up for eight years now. Education is the key here. People who want to remain, you know, willfully blind are a problem. Uh, but people who are willing to open their eyes, look at the evidence, become very committed to real action. So in the case of the premiers, in the case of, of our whole society, start with we need governance models that are more focused around how do we achieve consensus and work together. So we are promoting, uh, which we did in 2015 as well, that, that in this Federation of Canada to work better, we need to rethink the boxes that have been in place since 1867. We need to give municipal governments a place at the table. Municipal and local governments are where most Canadians live. They're responsible for most of what happens. Sometimes say, you know, if, if you're, if you're City workers go on strike, you know right away because the garbage piles up and no one's collecting the recycling and everybody feels it. I don't know how Canadians would know if the federal government went on strike it, when, when, we, when you didn't have to pay your taxes. I mean, we, the, the, the real crunch where the rubber hits the roads is municipal governments and they're not at the table. So our model comes from Australia. It's called the Council of Canadian Governments, which does what Australia does and create, uh, you know, in, in their case, federal, state, and municipal. But ours is in, is in quadrants with also indigenous leadership, First Nations, Métis, Inuit. And so the first minister's concept becomes the Council of Canadian Governments to set high-level goals, because we're a country without policy. Right? You've, you've seen it a million times. Canada's the only country in the OECD that has no housing policy. Canada's the only country in the OECD that has no transportation policy, cultural policy, fill in the blank. We're just, we operate ad hoc, and so different orders of government pulling in different directions is frustrating to to citizens. Certainly, you know, you're, there's only one taxpayer. That's just called federalism. It's better. We have an improved model of federalism that we want to bring to Canada, where we also have a seat at the table for our local governments. We don't have to change the constitution to do this. We just have to listen. Now, in that context, we have to start with evidence always. In this country, we tend to start with the politics. We need to start with the evidence. So, what I would do at the end of this next election and with whatever tools are at my disposal, is urged that before we even have the election of the speaker, we convene parliament as a committee of the whole and bring in the top climate experts from around the world and let anyone ask any question that's on their mind. If it takes days, we listen. And because it's a public space and broadcast on CPAC, Canadians can listen. And there's a gallery right above the speaker for reporters and they can listen. I am a firm believer that there is no person in this country who's been elected to office who can't be reached through evidence. Some are slow learners. Some may refuse to hear the information. But anyone who's honest and willing to listen to the information can be very easily persuaded that this is not an issue on which we take chances. We don't get a second chance. And while we have the opportunity to do the things that need to be done, I think we will engage everyone. Now, for purposes of argument, Diane, let's just assume there's some premiers who don't want to hear. We don't need provincial engagement to solve the problem. It helps. It sure helps. Uh, and I've, I learned a lot from working in the Mulroney government. The approach that Mulroney took on acid rain was not to get every premier in the room and insist on an agreement where the lowest common denominator could bar agreement. We executed agreements with the seven eastern provinces picking off the easiest first. There were essentially no sulfur dioxide emissions from PEI. PEI signed the first binding federal accord to cut sulfur dioxide emissions by 50%. Hmm. The last, you're not surprised, was Ontario, where INCO was the single largest, single point source of sulfur dioxide on the continent. Surely that's what the Trudeau government tried to do with carbon hmm. pricing. And they they tried did the to opposite. Deals, they tried to make deals with different provinces, and it looked as though they would have a rough national consensus, yeah. and then all of a sudden, guess what? The populations voted in different governments. Well, first of all, the Trudeau administration, based on their platform, 
I certainly, I expected that when Justin Trudeau went to Paris, the first thing he would do would be to pick a target that was consistent with the Paris Agreement and the goals we were now talking about. I think he might have done so with more pressure, but in any case, we ended up at the end of that year having Catherine McKenna in Paris said, the current target is weak, we know that, it's the floor, we can do better. Within a year, she was saying it's a ceiling, we can't reach it. 30% below 2005 levels by 2030, Canada's current target was put in place by Leona Aglukuk in May of 2015 more than six months before we negotiated in Paris, and it's still our target, and it's inadequate. But going back to... So you, you were, it seems in retrospect, that you were a bit overly trusting of Justin Trudeau and his government. Probably. But I also pressed hard. I pressed as hard as I could. I wish that others had pressed him more, you know, more forcefully. But the reality of where we are now, and in terms of what a... Pro you, you said that Justin Trudeau did what I suggested. So just to go back to that, they didn't. They handed over to the Deputy Minister of Environment Canada the job of negotiating with all the provinces as a group, the Pan-Canadian Framework. The Pan-Canadian Framework was the mechanism by which 30% below 2005 by 2030 got locked in because the architect and the person holding the pen, not to personalize it too much, but it happens that the Deputy Minister of Environment Canada was the one who developed the target that Leona Gluca had put in place six months before. And so at a level of not political leadership, but what happens in the machinery of government, that we didn't do high level, the prime minister wants to talk to the premier. What are you prepared to do? We want a deep target from you because that allows us to put more pressure on the next guy. We did not do one at a time. We did group think at a bureaucracy level and out the other end came essentially a patchwork of what provinces were already prepared to do, stitched up and called the Pan-Canadian Framework, without any new programs on the table from the federal government. So federal leadership has been absent. I, I can't get over, I mean, as you can see, unfortunately, for all of you and for me, I have a long memory. I have stories. The current government is, is, is a history-free zone. They don't even remember what the Liberals did in 2005. But the plan that Paul Martin brought forward in 2005 is more ambitious than what we have now and would have worked. The 2005 plan was pretty good for its time, excellent. So was I trusting? I assumed when I said to Bill Moore, no, Bill, I hope your 2015, I hope your 2016 budget is go back and look at Ralph Goodale's budget from 2005. Oh, that's just the start. That's just the beginning. Well, it took me a while to realize They'd never read the 2005 plan. They never went back to look at the 2005 budget. They didn't have a clue because the 2016 budget essentially ignored climate. The 2017 budget essentially ignored climate. It took till this year to finally see rebates from the federal government for electric vehicles and a one-year only program on energy retrofits. I don't understand it. Anybody want to jump in? Yeah. Scott? Yeah, hi, I'm Scott Colby, the opinions editor at The Star. They say the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and expecting the different results. <laughs> it seems like you're doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. How do you really reach the people? I mean, you, you, you get the people get the government they deserve, right? Mm -hmm. Why are we electing governments that are putting tax cuts ahead of the environment? I mean, how do you really get to people? I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know how you, like you seem to me, you're saying the same thing and we've been doing this for years and years and years and years, but you well, know, we're not, we're, not, we're not getting there. Thank you, Scott. First of all, for the Green Party and for me personally, the IPCC report changes everything because it says we still have time to get to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And it says going to two puts us at a very high risk of tripping into accelerating, self-accelerating, unstoppable runaway global warming. I didn't talk about that in 2015 because I didn't think that was what we were looking at. I thought we had more time than we do. The IPCC, by the way, again, having just seen Joe Oliver once again reemerging in the national scene, claiming that the IPCC has said this sort of thing before. No, they haven't. The Intergovernmental Cl Panel on Climate Change, which was created, as I mentioned, with some Canadian leadership that came right out of the Toronto Conference in 88, has been historically conservative 
in its judgments. Where it has been wrong, and it's been wrong, has been in underestimating impacts and overestimating how much time we have. So I am not sanguine. I have never imagined myself going to the Canadian electorate and said, it's now or never, it's do or die. We have to fix this problem, at least change the trajectory. I'm not saying we arrive at a promised land before the next election, but if we don't change trajectories quite rapidly, we are going to go in the direction we are now headed and it will be unstoppable. So I'm not doing the same thing over and over. Uh, definitely, politics as usual will do the same thing over and over, right? I see that cliff every time I hear Catherine McKenna saying the environment and the economy go hand in hand. Increasingly, I just keep thinking of Thelma and Louise in that last moment because we're going off a cliff, right? So I have to stay, as I am, a responsible grown-up in the room. I am not going to disparage the moto motives of my friends and colleagues, regardless of what party they're in. We all need to work together. And I think a call for status quo politics is over. Status quo decision making is over. We need to work together in an internal cabinet together that's a survival cabinet that gives the public confidence that we have a nonpartisan consensus that doesn't get switched after the next election. Because that is, as you said, Andrew, that's always the disaster. A new government comes in, cancels everything. You know, Paul Martin's plan was great, but then Stephen Harper canceled it without a single vote in Parliament. Okay, we can't risk that now. We're out of time. We've got time for just two more questions. Speaking oh, of two. time. <laughs> so we're about to go into an election. You've, and the, it's sort of neck and neck, more or less. We, you know, most of the uh, uh, pundits are talking about minority. And you've conspicuously not, unlike uh, the NDP leader, ruled out uh, making some kind of deal if it's a minority with any of the other parties. So, you, and you at the same time you talk about a war cabinet and, uh, or, uh, I'm sorry, uh, it's not a war cabinet. Uh, oh, a climate, whatever. Wh whatever. We want. In, internal in, cabinet. To internal deal with cabinet an existential on this. threat. So what? What? So we we end up uh, on October 23rd and following with a minority, and you've got this scenario of an inner sort of whatever emergency cabinet what position do you, presumably you want to be in that cabinet what do you would you want to be environment minister is that the would that be your key demand oh no I, I don't make demands ideally I'm prime minister in this scenario I mean I, we're we're blue skying it here why not but slightly more realistic, realistically I don't know I'm not trying to be on it, it an internal cabinet of that kind does not replace so the war cabinet model survival cabinet for instance, Churchill, Mackenzie King had the entire normal cabinet populated as normally by the party in power. The internal cabinet is to, is to direct something that is foundational. Uh, there's no good English equivalent for un projet de société. Right? This is deeply everyone together, all hands on deck. I want to be there as leader of the Green Party, working together with the leaders of the other parties, one of whom will be prime minister. But I'm not seeking any, and this is the problem with, well, as soon as we start talking about minority parliament and a lot of the social media, Twitter stuff, and the way I get asked the question, I was just recently uh, lambasted for apparently spending my time thinking about how I'm going to be a kingmaker instead of trying to get Greens elected, which is a fascinating criticism, given that what I do day to day is work very hard to get Greens elected. <laughs> and when asked by journalists, I answer honestly, what would I do? In a minority parliament, Greens around the world, my colleagues around the world, and I'm, I'm by the way, I'm co-chair of something called the Global Greens Parliamentarians Association. There are 400 elected Greens at the federal level around the world. I've got lots of friends to go to to talk about what did you do in New Zealand? How did you negotiate? What did you do in Sweden? How did it go? Those kinds of questions. And I don't have to go outside the country to ask Andrew Weaver, how did you negotiate? Yes, they talked to the BC Liberals. Yes, they talked to the BC New Democrats. My friend Bob Brown, leader of the Green Party of Australia, yes, he talked to Labour and Julia Gillard. Yes, he talked to the right-wing coalition that was clearly never going to take climate action. But you talk to everybody. But Greens are never in it to get something for us. We're not trying to get a better perk, you know, some little position that will, some crumb off the table. When we're talking about survival, all we want is to ensure that whatever government is formed following this election is committed to the survival of our children with concrete steps that we can count on. And if they're not, they won't pass the first confidence vote on the speech from the throne.
Uh, Doug Cudmore, I'm the senior Toronto editor here. We've talked a lot about uh, internal politics. Um, one of the things about uh, any kind of debate around climate change is countries always have the, well, other countries aren't going to do anything, so why should we put ourselves at an uh, economic disadvantage? Uh, how would you and your party uh, uh, approach uh, international relations uh, differently than the way that uh, current and past parties have? Thank you, Doug. I, we are, not surprisingly, being a global party, we're very committed to international in action, we're committed to multilateralism. Uh, we are very opposed to global corporate rule, which if, if anyone were to ask me what's the difference between Canada in 1987 and leadership to save the ozone layer and Canada in 97 going to Kyoto, the difference is the arrival of global corporate rule in the form of the World Trade Organization and the work that was done in every cabinet, in every government around the world to take away enforcement mechanisms from climate treaties or environmental treaties in general. So Montreal 87, we had an enforcement mechanism. It's still there. Any country that violates the ozone protocol can be visited by trade sanctions from every other country in the agreement. Kyoto, no enforcement mechanism. So, so we are internationalists, but we're not globalists. And working internationally with colleagues, we have a very good sense, I think a good view of the world and how we engage. Against all odds, and my God, I'm a proud Canadian for this reality, against all odds, we are very respected in the world. We have a lot of clout. And it appalls me that anyone, you might want to ask my friend Andrew when he's here, how it is that anyone can think they are suited to be prime minister if you think Canada is too small to matter and that's how you want to campaign. Canada is never too small to matter. We really matter. And when we get our own house in order, just as, I mean, going back to that example of acid rain, Brian Mulroney's plan was get our own house in order, then we can go to Ronald Reagan with clean hands, and we can actually get something out of a president who had said acid rain was caused by ducks. We can get him to take an economic hit in the coal-burning heart of the U.S. heartland and do it because Brian's a nice guy. I mean, who knows why? It was weird, but it happened. So Canada, I mean, I've, I've been involved in, in the global politic of climate since the first preparatory committee meeting to the Rio Earth Summit in August 1990 in Nairobi. As I said, front row seat to failure for many years. But I know what we need right now in the global climate negotiations is some leadership. There is a vacuum. It used to be Angela Merkel and the EU were always the gold standard, the white knights in the room. They've been hobbled. Angle is no longer in the picture and so on. So, Obviously, Trump is a horror on this. Macron wanted to be a white knight, but he's compromised by his own classist, billionaire class decision making, which is, again, where the yellow vest came in. So we need Canada. We need to be the country that says, yeah, we are an oil sands country. Yep, we've developed a lot of our economy based on fossil fuels. And we're here to say that as the first World, world leader to say it was Francois Sarkozy. That's how long ago it was. And from a right winger, global civilization is at stake. We have to do this. We should be, by the way, going to the United Nations Climate Summit on September 23rd. And we will not be there as far as I know because we'll be in a writ. But I have called for on the floor of the House of Commons that while the students around the world are going on a, uh, and calling for a general climate strike in that window, we should, as party leaders, have a campaign strike. Stop campaigning. All party leaders together should go to New York to make sure that Canada is in the global negotiation and pushing other countries to do more. Because right now, most countries around the world are doing way more than we are. So we are in no position to say, we won't move till you do. No, I'm sorry. We are one of the world's largest polluters per capita, and we're one of the world's top 10 most polluting countries in just ranking of countries. We have to do more, and when we do more, we can play a role of global leadership, because Lloyd Axworthy was right, we've always punched above our weight. When Stephen Harper was prime minister, we still punched above our weight, and we sabotaged action in the international negotiations for years. We have to do the reverse now. On that note, thank you so much for coming. We've been talking with Green Party leader Elizabeth May, and tomorrow, uh, Wednesday, the 4th of September at noon, we'll have Andrew Scheer, leader of the Conservative Party of Canada, here for a similar discussion. Thanks so much. Thank you.